Greetings, fellow sword nerds. It's Star. here one more time. Last time we visited, I was celebrating 100 subscribers, and now we're over 200 subscribers. I don't know what's going on, but to celebrate, let's um, go to the movies. Now, it's always fun when you have an expert historian or HEMA fencing master specialist uh, go in and eviscerate a fictional uh, movie combat sequence or, or sword fight. Um, let's turn it around a little bit this time, since I'm not an expert in any of those subjects in particular. Um, let's go and look at some bad movie fights, and why don't we see if there's anything redeeming about them? You know, Mom always said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Let's see if we can actually find something nice and educational. Maybe we can learn something about the type of swords that are featured. We'll, instead of saying mean things, we'll, we'll try and come away having learned something from even these particularly mm, from these movies that were probably never going to be Oscar contenders, at least as far as the fight sequences go. So, let's see what the first one is. Okay, the first one here is going to be from 2002, The Scorpion King, featuring Dwayne The Rock Johnson as the titular Scorpion King versus Stephen Brand as Memnon. Okay, here comes Rock. And uh oh. So both of them each have one sword. Now, they're going at it. Let's talk about the swords for just a second. So uh, I'll pause it when we see Rock's sword. There we go. Okay, so what's the setting? The setting is the third millennia BC. Um, are the swords accurate at all? No, they aren't, of course. Um, and at this, you know, rocks representing the last of the Akkadians. In this period, swords were really just becoming a thing. Um, we are in the copper transitioning to the Bronze Age. Um, we may have started to see some very early forms of sickle sword, what would eventually become known as Kalpesh at that time. But otherwise, you're really just talking about to be honest, most people would have been fighting probably using axes as hand weapons, if not spears. Um, there could have been large daggers or otherwise just kind of straight cruciform swords. So I said I was going to try and say nice things about the film, but I have to point out that the sword that The Rock is carrying has done a great deal of disservice to the sword community because it is what is called a scimitar, or is what is commonly referred to as a scimitar. Now, my good friend Ipo Swords has a video dedicated just to why we don't refer to swords in modern sword collecting as scimitars. It's an antiquated term. You can find it used throughout European literature, probably starting from the 16th century onwards. But it really doesn't describe a certain style of sword other than a non-European curved sword, which is very non-specific. This one is not even following a historical design. It is at best um, taking cues from certain Ottoman swords, maybe from the 17th century, but it's kind of taking them to outlandish proportions, the size of the flared back, the yellman. Um, the grip is way longer than you'd find on anything like that because it's basically accommodating two hands. And after this film was released in 2002, all sorts of places you could buy these as mostly non-functional uh, weapons, and they fall under the name... Scorpion King Sword, or Scorpion King Scimitar, or Fantasy Scimitar, or Arabian Scimitar, or, you know, Moorish Scimitar. And so, a lot of times you end up with people asking for identification and asking, what is a scimitar, or what do scimitars look like? And if you just type that into Google, you'll end up with something that looks like this, which is basically not a historical sword. So, sorry, Rock, uh, you don't have a historical sword. Let's see, let's watch a little bit more of the fight. All right, go up top, big swing, one-handed swing from Rock, going after Memnon. Oh, bit of a spin. Oh no, it's a good thing he has pecs instead of armor. Yeah, get rid of that armor, we don't need that anymore. Big kick, and oh no, snakes! If only he had something sharp to chop the snakes! There you go, Rock, what a good idea. All right, so they're going after each other a little bit more. Big, heavy sweeping strikes with these big, powerful sabers. Some spins, a couple of kicks, overhead block, and a back parry. So 
Just pausing it for a second, Rock used the other hand on the back of his sword. He put it on the Yelman. Now, if this was a proper killage with a um, with a false edge, uh, I don't have any good examples offhand. Um, here, maybe I could use this longest messer. So this long messer doesn't have a raised false edge, but it does have a false edge. And if you were to block with it and you put your hand on that, you could end up getting pretty badly cut. So you'd probably want to block with your hand on the back of the spine where it's a little flat. So using that technique isn't terrible, but probably putting your hand on the wrong portion of the sword. <laughs> All right, Rock, come on, you can do it. Oh no, what happened? His sword turned, Memnon's sword turned into two swords. This is insane. So is there any nugget of truth to what Memnon just displayed there? Rock is completely flabbergasted. Believe it or not, we can actually take away something from this. So this film is set in Egypt in, the, again, the third millennia BC, so long before any of the famous Egyptian uh, dynasties. However, if we study um, the in the Steel Age, going into the 15th century, the, uh, 14th and 15th century, we have examples from the um, the Mamluk period of Egyptian history indicating that they practiced at least horsemanship, if not infantry use of swords with two swords at a time. We can see this practice in the illuminated manuscripts, the um, Phorosia, that depict horsemen using two sabers even uh, at a time. So it is very anachronistic to say that that type of sword play was used for certain in the time period that this movie is set. Is it possible that we'll find something that's even more out of place as this goes along? Let's let's let it play out a little bit further. Oh no, fire, even worse than snakes. More fire! Come on, Rocky, what are we gonna do? Big sweeping cuts. Nope, he's on his back fist now. And we're going completely out of control with two swords. Oh no, the snake has come back. Oh, I'll take care of that quickly. A big kick. Memnon can't reach Rock. Oh no, there's guys behind him. Rock is completely backed in. What is the Scorpion King going to do? Gideon was the thing. I didn't remember that. All right, the guards are coming in. Let's see if I can see what they're wearing. It looks like they are wearing. They are carrying straight bladed swords. This. This is closer to what would have been in use at the time. Again, these are, these would have been most likely co early copper or bronze swords. To be honest, I think that these are probably reused props for extras from an earlier film. Um, based on the date, I don't remember if Troy had already come out, but these look like reused uh, Zephos um, props, probably from some um, Greek film that had gone on. All right, Michael Clark Duncan getting in the action. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's see. I think we just got what we wanted to see. The camera works jumping around a little bit. And there. There we go, we got a nice view of it. So, Memnon, as you saw earlier, split his one sword into two swords. But in addition to it, we can now see the profile a little bit better. If I just, ah, there, we can pause it. So we have a disc guard, a little bit of a curved handle, and this kind of distinct pommel cap. And again, remember, his sword is split into two. Memnon is a very advanced and possibly, possibly a time traveler. He is carrying a Dao, a Chinese Dao, and not just any Dao, it's a special type of Dao that did come in this configuration, where you could pack two swords into a single scabbard, and then it would split apart in, at the hilt. So each, rather than having a single discard, it would split into two. This is called a Shong Dao, or double Dao. Um, and they were very popular starting towards the middle or late uh, Qing dynasty. 
Um, it, they may have started slightly earlier than that, but definitely by the mid Qing, um, you see them coming to you. So this style, as depicted here, is probably from the late 18th, early 19th century. So he is using super advanced technology here, which is probably why Rocky is having so much trouble. This particular sword is a little hard to see for sure, but um, it would probably be... Mm, this blade shape would probably be called a Luye Dao um, or a uh, willow leaf saber. It might be a Yanling Dao uh, or a goose uh, um, feather saber. Um, so something basically like this, but split into two. And if any anyone watching is fans of uh, Avatar The Last Airbender cartoon series, they'll be very familiar with the concept of one sword being able to split into two pieces and be stored and be stored into a single scabbard. Um, so he uh, he has some very advanced uh, weaponry to go up against Rock. Let's see how this resolves itself. Oh, here we got to watch Michael Clark Duncan. He grabs Rock Rocky's saber and throws it to the air, and Rock catches it. Nod from Michael Clark Duncan, and time to get business done right into the fire with no protection whatsoever. That's why the rock gets paid the big bucks. Okay, so we learned at least a couple things about swords. The rest of the movie is about what you would expect. Um, yeah, a lot of fun. Interesting fact, uh, years and years ago, Rock and I used to be almost neighbors and we used to go to the gym at the same time. I used to see him all the time. Clearly he and I use the exact same workout routine. Uh, okay, that was that was pretty entertaining. Uh, I'll give it uh, three and a half out of five scimitars for accuracy. Next up, we are going to do Shanghai Nights, the Jackie Chan and Owen Wilson buddy cop film. This is set in London in the Victorian era in 1887. So let's see what they're getting into. All right. Is that Donnie Yen? I can't remember that Donnie Yen was in this. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie. Uh-oh, he has... What does the bad guy have? Let's see if we can see a better picture. Oh, no! He has a Chinese broadsword. This is actually 100% perfect. 100% accurate. This is, would be one of the most popular weapons for um, a civilian to have, or a ne'er-do-well, a Chinese ne'er-do-well. Uh, we have images from uh, police captures and police raids from China in the late Qing, and a bunch of these type of blades are captured. So the Chinese broadsword, more commonly known as the um, oxtail dao or the new wei dao, it was a very popular um, civilian weapon. It was never used in the military. So there were other types of waist dao, waist, a pei dao, or waist saber, with different types of, of profiles uh, that were used. They usually weren't quite as heavy in the cut, um, but among um, irregular forces, uh, village militias, bodyguards, um, wushu schools, martial artists, um, and again, just ruffians or someone who wanted to keep their own blade at home for personal protection against burglars, bandits, yada yada. Uh, this was the weapon of choice. It seemed to become more popular in as um, the, the whole of China started to move away from uh, more heavier armors and perhaps was wearing just more uh, linen, um, you know, he heavier clothing as the pro proliferation of firearms uh, went on across the board. So this, I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll give credit where credit is due. They, they, uh, they picked the right sword in this case. Okay, he got taken out by Chung Wen. So let's see what else. So they are then going to go after the evil Lord Nelson Rathbone, He's got a gun. who has a gun. Oh no! Come on. And they pursue him, and we see that he's carrying a saber of some kind. We'll come back to that. So they have to arm themselves before they can go. Nailed Artie with a little sissy gun. I look after him. You two go. Go. 
So how are they going to arm themselves? And it looks like they're in the lower parts of Parliament, and apparently in Parliament there's an armory, and so on one of the displays they found a pair of rapier. Um, these, it's a little hard to date them. These look to be uh, a later style of rapier. They have cup hilts that are pierced through, so, you know, rapiers start to become popular at the end of the, you know, mid-late 16th century, and then they continue in use for another 150 plus years, depending on where the, um, in I the Iberian Peninsula, they remain on f almost into the 19th century. Um, to me, this looks like perhaps 17th century rapier, maybe mid 17th century, could be English. We'll see what they end up doing with them. For fun. All right, for Jackie, where are we for gonna fun. do? So they are chasing after Aiden Gillen. See you. No. Show your now, face, interestingly Ryan, enough, Owen Jerry's Wilson, you got this Mr. Roy O'Bannon, is you carrying his rapier in his left hand. Okay. Is Owen Wilson left-handed? I'm not sure. All right, we're searching. Uh oh. Jackie, where's your friend? All right, holding the rapier in two hands. Believe it or not, there are examples of two handed rapiers. There's not very much reference to two handed rapier use in surviving manuals. If uh, someone's aware of a lot of plays that involve uh, two hands on the rapier, please share that with me because offhand, and I definitely don't specialize in, in rapier systems. Um, I'd like to see that. But we do know of several examples of surviving rapiers where the whole hilt is spring-loaded and extends so that the um, blade and guard slide out and doubles the length of the hilt and can accommodate two hands. All right, where's Rathbone? Oops. Here comes Rathbone. All right, we're going to pause it right there. So as Rathbone comes on screen, you can see that he is carrying a saber. Now, it's not just any saber, and we'll get a better look at it later. This saber is an Indian tulwar. Now, it's not any type of Indian tulwar. It's a very specialized type of Indian tulwar that has a half basket attached, um, much like you'd find on a military, uh, 19th century British military, uh, let's say, officer's sword or, or cavalry saber. Um, I have asked some of my buddies who are experts in Indian arms and armor, and they have never seen this particular configuration before, where a tulwar, which has all of the constructions of a standard tulwar held, has the langets coming up from it, the disc pommel on the bottom, then has a western-style cage attached to it. Um, there's a very few, a very limited number of Indian sabers that have some additions to them that kind of imitate a European style, but done in a, an Indian fashion, because there are some Indian swords that have um, other types of knuckle guards and, and um, kind of Kanda style baskets, or even uh, some of the shorter swords and daggers like Qatar have um, some hand protection on them. Um, this particular one, though, very interesting that the props department decided to do that. This is during the British Raj. I don't know if Lord Rathbone um, was supposed to have spent time in India. I'd have to go back and watch the film to see if there's any indication of that. So he's got his solar. Oh, no. Kick through Big Ben. That's rough. So now Jackie throws his rapier up. Is that a problem? No, that's completely reasonable. Um, rapiers are really good at penetrating things. If you give it a hefty shove, it should be able to go th straight into wood as long as it's not completely dense. Would it stick? That's a bit... He'd probably have to get a little bit lucky for it to stay and not just fall up. out. Um, but right died. now, he then reaches under. He should be able to pull it out, no problem at all. So that's completely reasonable. So now Jackie is coming up, and he's wielding the rapier by himself. And who knew Littlefinger could fence so well? So Littlefinger is fencing with two, two weapons at a time, which is fine. Um... He's using the rapier in his left hand. Now, a rapier is a very big and heavy weapon in most cases. So the term rapier covers 
a tremendous variety of swords and um, earlier rapiers in general were heavier and longer and then they become lighter as we start and getting closer to the uh, 18th century and their transition into small swords um, this particular one as we'll see later looks like it's designed off of one of the perhaps earlier types of rapier that had both cut and thrusting ability some rapiers cannot uh, cut very well at all their cross section is triangular or pyramidal and doesn't really allow for um for any cutting ability um others are very good uh, cut and thrust compromised designs um, however, the speed at which he's using it indicates that this is a very light sword instead of the long, you know, in excess of a meter length blades that are heavy and good for stabilizing and keeping the point on line instead of it wobbling all around while you're trying to land your thrust. So the prop is probably made of aluminum and not as heavy as the, the blade actually should be, which allows him to use it very quick, even though he's using it in his left in his offhand. Uh-oh. Pull bar to the chest. Oh my goodness, look at all these spins! And a slap in the face, what an insult! Come on, Jackie, you can do better than that. Jackie's doing a good job blocking everything, I'm not seeing that much attack from Jackie. Uh-oh. So, Rathbone has been doing a lot of twirls. Now, this is ostensibly a Jackie Chan film. Um, something they should have brought up in the last one. So, I've mentioned that I in love watching um, my fellow YouTubers go over other fight reviews and as I've watched them I've been learning from them I've uh, been able to watch Todd and uh, Matt Easton and Dave Rawlings and uh, Tobias Capwell and um, an aspect that they've brought up in some of their video reviews past is that the the development of sword fighting on film and their choreography originally in the early days of cinema it came from the stylistic fightings that you'd see in theater pro theatrical productions which in turn came from uh military saber so in military saber if i pull here if i pull a military saber it, so with this spadroon which was used in the same format you have a lot of hand protection on the top and on, on the front when you're working with military saber which allows you to fight with your hand in a very advanced position this is different than how fighting would be in earlier time periods, let's say with a simple medieval sword, where you might keep your hand in a more retreated position. But that didn't matter when you're choreographing um, sword fights in, in uh, Hollywood. So whether it was Zorro or whether it was an Errol Flynn, um, anything like that, they would fight with their swords kind of in an advanced position uh, in front of them, uh, regardless of what period that they were fighting in. In the 1990s, this changed. Uh, a big influx of kung fu um, revolution kind of took over, uh, even within Hollywood. So with the popularity of ja Jackie Chan, with the popularity of The Matrix and its stunt choreographer, uh, Wu Yong, uh, Wun Yong Ping, I think that's his name, um, with uh, even Star Wars The Phantom Menace, you end up seeing a lot more um, kung fu influence uh, in the story, the fight choreography and the swordplay choreography than you did in the decades previous. This happens all the time. So in the 1980s, there was a, a karate boom and a ninja boom. And in the 90s, we start seeing more of an interest in, in, um, in kung fu. So what we're seeing here is definitely a more Chinese-themed uh, choreographed sequence rather than an emphasis on Jackie using Kung Fu techniques and Rathbone using English techniques. Uh, let's see as we watch some of the other movies if this holds true, where the older ones have a different style of choreography than the, the newer films. All right, so now he's adopting a more traditional English posture where he's taking individual advancing steps and keeping his big heavy uh, saber with the guard in front and keeping the other hand in the rear. Okay, so this looks more like traditional military saber where he's using his hand in the back. Oh, poor Jackie. And he uses the Tolwar to cut the rope. Is that possible? Sure. Tolwar is very strong and very powerful. You could probably cut a rope if you got a good slice in, especially with Jackie holding it taut. You hear that? Spotted dick! So let's see what happens now. 
gives Jackie back the rapier. How sporting. And again, two hands going after Jackie. Very difficult to keep the fight with two swords at time. Here, we'll take a quick pause. Here. And you can just make out some of the elements that make this characteristically, um... Make this characteristically Tolwar. So you can see the uh, langet on the top of it. You can see the long blade with the multiple fullers. This is showing the Ind Indian heritage of the uh, the saber. So Jackie's doing a lot of defending, not that much advancing. And again, he's swinging with the the rapier, but uh, he really should be poking with it more if uh, he wanted to have a better chance of success. Doing his best with an Im improvised weapon. All right, here we are fighting once again. Ooh, nasty slice in the forearm. Rathbone showing supreme control over his weapons and his adversary. Now, Jack, unfortunately, does not have a weapon in his offhand. If he did, he might be able to um, have some sort of an advantage, even if he had a shield. Uh, Rathbone has two weapons, which is fine. You can fight with the the other weapon simultaneously, especially if the your opponent's at a disadvantage with only a single sword. Um, Jackie looks like maybe he's trying to get his hand in to grab another weapon, which is possible, but you have to really figure out when um, is a good opportunity to do that. Otherwise, you're just putting that hand at risk of being sniped and <laughs> being chopped off. So he's using an unfamiliar weapon, and he's not sure of the exact technique to, to use with it. And as a result, he doesn't know how to get his body completely off uh, offline to present a, a narrower target. And uh, he's unfortunately suffering as a result of that. Eee, this is a terrible situation to be in. I would not want to be in that situation. So we can see the profile of the uh, rapier blade. It's got a fuller on it. It's got a reasonably wide uh, base uh, that is starting from. This is this intended to be an older style um, cut and thrust rapier. It's obviously not just because of how fast they're moving it. That said, J Jackie is particularly lucky. Unless he's wearing a gorget or some type of leather buff collar uh, under there, I would not want to have the point of that um, against me. Even a very gentle thrust, as long as that tip is, hasn't been damaged, a, a properly sharpened blade, just the slightest of... Um, effort is going to go straight through the soft tissue of his neck, even if there's a, a little bit of fabric there. Oh, poor Rod. Oh, what's Rathbone have there? Is that the double-ended sword from Elden Ring? Hmm. Maybe the creators uh, watched Shanghai Knights before they made the weapon. Very interesting. One more. All right, we're going to do it one more time. And poor Jackie cannot catch a break, it looks like. And we'll end the fight there. Oh, poor Jackie. So finally won up by someone, and it had to be a stodgy Brit at that. Well, that was a lot of fun. So uh, we got to see a decent number of, of different swords. Um, the, the action sequence was, was actually pretty fun. Again, uh, this sometimes happens when you have a... A kung fu uh, film, um, even if they have someone from a different culture and they come in, they're much more likely to fight in a kung fu style, uh, just because, of course, that's whoever your fight choreographer is, they're going to make sure that it fits the uh, the um, flavor of whatever the, the film is. Um, on the whole, I'll, I'll give it uh, four and a half out of five uh, Chinese broadswords. Not too bad. Wow. Okay, moving along, we're going to, I'm going to show you a film that hopefully you've never seen, um, because no one else saw it aside from me, apparently. It's called Cutthroat Island from um, 1995 with uh, Gina Davis and Frank uh, Langella, I believe, that are going to be featured in there. I think even Sean Penn might make an appearance. Um, 
No one saw this movie because it was a financial disaster. It was one of the largest flops in recorded history at, uh, at the time. I think it uh, it even uh, overtook Waterworld uh, when it was released. Um, so this is set in the late 17th century um, during the Golden Age of Piracy. Let's see what sorts we can learn about today. Okay, so even before we get started, let's take a look here. So our heroine, Gina, is, uh, Morgan, is carrying what looks like a main gauche, so a, a left-handed dagger over here, and she has some sort of a clip-backed or false-edged um, curved sword. Let's see what we get. All right. Forgive me. I will come back. Morgan! The whole ship's going to blow! Oh, Morgan. Ah! Okay, now something very interesting is covering Morgan's face right now. We'll ignore it for a second, but remember that profile. As she's coming up, let's see if we can see the sword, the rest of the sword in her right hand. Morgan! Oh, we're going to cut to dog for a that second. boy doesn't understand us, Morgan. But then he's not so There's her main gauche. Okay, so we can see that her sword is got a bit of a basket hilt going on, but it's not a very long blade. So what is this called? Um, it would go by a whole bunch of different names, and this is kind of a joke among um, sword, sword historians, sword collectors, sword nerds. Um, there are a whole bunch of different names for these type of single-edged, short, very choppy, very cutty swords. Um, depending on what country you're in, depending on exactly which century it's being discussed, it, the same type of sword could go by any of several different names. Um, and since we're speaking in English, we usually use British terms. Uh, at this time, it would probably be called a hanger, a British hanger. However, um, because they're not on on land and they're in the water, it might be called a, a cutlass or a cutto. Um, cutlass would be like the naval equivalent to a short saber um, on land, which would otherwise be called a hanger. However, um, these ones that have more complex um, guards on them rather than just like a simple cross or quillon might, um, depending on where they're from, might, if they were Italian, they might be called a storta. And if they were from Germany, uh, the Bohemian region, um, Norway, they would be called a dusak or dusage or tessic. So, this could be any of a number of things. Um, it's a pirate movie, so it would be called perhaps a cutlass, although it doesn't look anything like cutlasses from the uh, the Royal Navy period where they have patterns of cutlass. So they're going at it. And, oh, let's see if I can pause it when Dog takes a big swipe. What are you doing? All right. I can't pause it when his blade is coming on screen. There we go. All right. So Dog has a shell hilted cutlass. And I'm going to go ahead and call it a Dusak. The reason I'm calling it a Dusak is because, again, it has this very distinctive blade that has teeth along the edge. Not only on the primary edge, but if we go back to where she was coming up, we can see it more distinctly. Um... It's got teeth on both the, the primary edge and even on the false edge. This is, there's been a couple of examples of these, probably the most famous example and probably the one that the prop maker bases on was, is in the Wallace collection. Um, these Dusak are sometimes thought to be very specifically for naval ships. And the idea is that perhaps it's got this serrated or sawtooth edge so that you can use it to cut through things utilitarian like. So if you need to cut through ropes or ships rigging or what have you, it's, it's there and it's handy. To me, I haven't seen any convincing evidence that that is the case at all. I've never seen it written about in a period source. Um, and again, on a ship, you're going to have access to a lot more other tools rather than just whatever convenient sword you have at hand. You have boarding axes, you have all sorts of other job-specific tools that you don't need <laughs> to use your sword for the task uh, at hand um, as well. Um, so it's kind of neat that they picked this kind of obscure sword and gave it to Dog. Now, the other thing that he's doing is he's using it in a two-handed grip. He's putting two hands in a very small sort of, well, I don't have an example, so of it, what is obviously a single-handed sword. Here. So going back to my spadroon. So what's obviously a single-handed sword, he's putting two hands in it and swinging it like that. Was that ever done historically? 
yes, we have both written accounts and period illustrations showing that this occasionally happened with single-handed swords, going all the way back to, you know, 9th and 10th century. Um, why was it done? It's not always clear. Now, if your other hand is free, if it's not holding a shield or another weapon, then obviously it's available to you. But the reasons for putting two hands on a sword that is not designed to be used in two hands, like a longsword or a katana, it's not entirely clear. It seems, if anything, like it may just be a way to bring additional strength into a blow. So if you d didn't have to consider defending yourself and you weren't using finesse in your strikes, if someone was already grounded, someone was just hiding behind their shield, then you could just put all of your effort into it and just give them a really heavy blow. Or if you were going up against a bigger target, maybe a horse or something. Um, so perhaps that's what's going on. And indeed, here he seems to just be trying to hammer through her um, blocks. So perhaps that's what's uh, happening. In this. <laughs> All right, so they made it up to the top of the ship. Mm, and you can see that this fighting is not the uh, most adept. They're kind of just pushing their swords at each other rather than using any cutlass or dosak techniques that would involve kind of large sweeping motions. They're kind of playing it safe with this choreography. And a pretty far cry from the type of combat we saw with the earlier uh, Kung Fu cinema. Alright, we got to see at least one strike. Oh no, kick going down. There's a lot of swashbuckling going on. How will this resolve? Uh oh. Oh, go ending up in fisticuffs. Hold out the sword again. The father was nothing. Uh oh, pushing her out on the point of her sword. How is she going to overcome this? Think Come on, Ma Morgan, you can do together, this. Morgan. You and me against the world. Join me. You don't have to die. How how can you overcome it when you have a sword you already did. at your throat? You've run out of world, Morgan. Uh oh. And I guess she wasn't able to overcome it. Well, you guys will have to watch the rest of the film to see how that um, comes out. So that was a little... Um, the, the, the fencing in that one probably left a lot to be desired. But we did still see a decent variety of, of weapons. I'm pretty happy that they stayed mostly true to the time period. And there was more than just, you know, a bog standard type of uh, plane hanger. Um, pirates were notorious for basically, you know, chucking all um, conventions and, and using whatever they could let, get their hands on. So if someone found a fancy Dusak, have no problem using using that. I give, I give this one three out of five cutlasses. Okay, so last up, we are going to look at, going back to 1991, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner... And Alan Rickman. Let's see how Robin Hood deals with a sheriff of Nottingham. Okay, we're already in the thick of it. Let's see what's happening. Yeah. All right, nice big hit. All right, so first of all, here, let's see what Alan Rickman's doing. So this is set um, after the... This is set during the time of the Third Crusade. This is set right at the end of the 12th century. Now, the Sheriff of Nottingham is wielding a big sword, a, a two-handed sword. Ostensibly, it's supposed to be like a long sword. And although some two-handed swords did exist in the 12th century, they are really a minority, and they really didn't look like this. The great swords of war were actually quite a bit bigger. This looks like it's more like a an actual, we would call a true long sword, which really don't start to, to show up until the, let's say, 15th century or, or so. So this is kind of a little bit late period. Let's, let's see what's going on here. That is quite the blow. That's either a very weak uh, little fence, or um, he's a much stronger swordsman <laughs> than I've seen. Up, oh, drop the sword. It was lodged. Now, that's something that's pretty realistic. If you do strike hard enough, that you're actually going to get your sword 
locked into something, then you absolutely risk either injuring your blade or having it pulled from your grasp. So it's depend. This is perhaps more of an issue if you're um, cavalry, if you're a mounted swordsman, but you always have to measure exactly how much effort you're putting into either a thrust or a, uh, a cut, because if you hit your target too deeply, then you risk getting your weapon stuck in your target, wh whether it's a horse or a man or armor, whatever you happen to be striking at, and then you're just going to end up with either a broken or a lost weapon as a result of that strike. So that's always something that you have to think about. How hard do I actually need to hit the target? Maybe you do need to hit the target that well, and you're willing to accept that your weapon is either going to risk being broken or lost. Um, in this case, he probably was going for overkill, and as a result, he lost his sword. Ooh, smacking his sword against the column. Uh, not a great way to extend the lifetime of your sword. Obviously, it can happen. There were sparks that flew. Sparks can fly if you strike a steel, ob uh, steel object against another steel or uh, stone. Um, let's see how the fight continues. Arming sword. Looks like maybe uh, a big type 12 arming sword. Picks up... Uh-oh, he's got a sword again! Wasn't expecting that! Now he's completely on the defensive! He never expected to have a sword in a sword fight! Okay, Robin, you have the high ground. What are you gonna do with it? Not much. Going away. Oh no! His sword got chopped clean in half now. In Kevin Costner's defense, he just smashed his sword against a steel column before. Or a, a concrete column previously. Not concrete. <laughs> it probably is concrete on the movie set. But uh, stone stone column previously. Um, so, did that cause the sword to have premature weakness and then lead it to a failure here? Possibly. Did swords break? Absolutely. So the historical record is littered, literally, with broken weapons of all types, including sword blades. Uh, we can see it in the art. We see it in written accounts all the time. Um, if you use your weapon enough, it will eventually give out. Um, so this, him taking a real hard static block against a powerful overhand swing, while it's not guaranteed to break your weapon, it absolutely can happen. And maybe it was the very first block that that weapon ever took, and it's just happened that the, uh, the steel was of suspect um, quality. Back once upon a time, they did, weren't able to refine the steel particularly well. You end up with all sorts of slag and nasty inclusions in it, and you have just one little bit of it did, that uh, allows a, a critical failure in the structure so that when you take a, a blow in just the right spot, it propagates a crack all the way through and your blade snaps in two. Or maybe it's developed nicks all the way along the floor. The, the fight, and one strong uh, hit allows enough flexing right at the point of that crack, and then the blade uh, goes all the way through. Either way, breaking is absolutely accurate and possible. It's not guaranteed to happen. You can never plan to hit someone and have their sword break and your sword not break, but it definitely did happen, and it was something that you just had to... Uh, understand is a possibility anytime that you're using swords um, to strike uh, anything, you know, aside from just flesh uh, repeatedly. All right, Robin, what are you going to do? Ah! He threw the, the hilt at the Sheriff of Nottingham. Is this a viable tactic? Sure, why not? Again, we discussed it previously that uh, there's plenty of um, techniques and recommendations for how to throw a sword um, and why would you do that? Well, maybe you want to hit a guy across the room and end the fight even before it starts. Uh, in this case, having the hilt, mm, I don't know that I w want to try and continue sword fighting someone who has a full blade if I only had the, the base of the, the fort of my sword and my little cross guard. So perhaps that was the better option, trying to hit him in the head, distract him long enough, and then do something else to, to tie up his weapon, uh, get in close and wrestle and punch him, uh, etc. Unfortunately, Kevin Costner is a terrible shot. It wasn't even close to hitting the Sheriff of Nottingham. Uh-oh. And now, he switches hand positions. So, I'll go back to this. You see that he brought the point of the sword 
against Robin's sternum, and after he had him so that he's not going to move anymore, he then switches hand position from a standard grip into a reverse grip. Now, I appreciate that Sellsword Arts has um, a medical condition that does not allow him to um, tolerate reverse grip on any type of European swords at all. And I basically agree with almost everything that he has to say on the topic. It's a, it's a great series that he has. I'd recommend you go and check it out if you're interested in the practical applications of trying to use a sword with the backwards grip. He's done more testing on the subject in um, Trial Ball Fire than I think anyone uh, else has that I've seen uh, put out there. However, however, that said, there are scores and scores of examples within the again, historical record, um, looking back at el medieval illuminations and paintings and manuscripts, indicating that not when we're fencing at a distance, but once you get very in close into grappling range, that swords are used in an ice pick style grip in many cases. This is for stabbing at someone who's very close to you, where maybe you're holding them, maybe your horses are right next against each other, maybe someone's on the ground, you're on, laying on top of them, you pull your sword out of your sheath with one hand, and then you bring it down on top of them, or you can get extra weight on them. So there's definitely plenty of evidence to suggest that this was done, all the way back to even in the... we have. Um, evidence for this being done as far back as Roman times in using the, the gladius. Um, if you're very close to your opponent, if you're trying to just stab them, so not using it for fencing, not using it to counter someone else's sword and try and gain an advantage and s slash at them, but if you're just trying to find a gap, trying to just end them, um, get the, the tip uh, into them easier, then yes, there is plenty to suggest that holding a sword in a reverse grip was done, even from horseback uh, at times. Uh-oh, don't get distracted by Marion. Big stab! Don't take your eyes off of your target. Must have gotten him in, in the diaphragm. Mm, oh, it looks like it's up in the lung. He's very surprised. I'd probably be very surprised if I had a dagger in myself as well. Are you going to keep fighting? Nope. And he's done. Nope, he's not quite done yet. He is done. And so we can see the uh, the sword that uh, Sheriff of Nottingham had a little... So we can't see the pommel, although I believe it's got a an open ring pommel, perhaps like an Irish pommel. It's got this um, oak shot type uh, style F cross, uh, slightly curved with... Um, a little bit of a, a raised point in the middle. And it's got a long blade, which has a fuller running down the majority of the length, which is probably something like a type 10A or something to that effect. Um, to me, it looks more like what you would find on a, um, a later period sword, but it's possible that you could find something uh, like this even as early as uh, the film is trying to depict. Another thing that's kind of interesting to note is that perhaps this hilt was intended to be gilded. Um, it, to me, it doesn't look like gold, probably because they did not use actual gold. Um, it's possible that this was intended to be a cast um, hilt made out of uh, brass or bronze. That was occasionally done. Uh, sometimes you find examples of swords where their um, components were cast out of a... Uh, a copper alloy, you end up with cast bronze uh, pommels. Um, occasionally, some, some famous ones like the Riven uh, hilted longsword that's got the twisted antler designs has uh, 
entirely cast fittings. All right, we're safe now. Oh no! The crone! And Azim has saved the day by throwing a 57-pound sword at the crone and sending her sailing across the room. Now, <laughs> I appreciate Azim, who's supposedly a, uh, a, a Saracen, I believe he was described as, and they gave him this overly large curved sword. Now, at this point in time, it's really too early to start seeing curved swords in the Middle East. The Saracens are sometimes depicted in medieval art as carrying curved swords, which would later be described um, as scimitars. Um, the term scimitar wasn't in use at this period in time, in the 12th century or even in the 13th century. Um, but later um, historians, European historians, would have called the images as depicted in this artwork as scimitars. Um, however, th these are more likely stylistic falchions. So the falchions are shown um, and used in his, uh, medieval history as a kind of shorthand to show who the bad guys are. Um, they're, uh, eventually, curved swords do become more popular in the Islamic world. It really starts to kick off following the Mongol invasions, which is, again, more of a 13th century sort of thing. This particular sword, however, is a fantasy sword. It's basically an oversized Indian uh, tolwar. Uh, these particularly large ones are called tega. Um, this one would not have been seen anywhere in the uh, in the Levant, um, nowhere in the Holy Lands. And again, it's more of like a, let's say, 17th or 18th century Indian design, um, but taken to comically large proportions. So it's it's kind of fun. It's a kind of uh, fun thing that they threw in there for Azim to have, but. What are you going to say to us? I Asim? have fulfilled my vow, Sajik. He has fulfilled his vow by throwing his sword across the room. You know what? That was a lot of fun. It actually had less um, inaccuracies than I remember, and there was a lot that we could actually talk about it there. So we'll go ahead and give that uh, five out of five little Johns. That was fun. All right, gang, so thank you so much for sitting in and watching this review. Hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. It, it was a lot of fun for me, and uh, we'll see about next time we'll continue doing more um, actual hands-on sword-related action. Take care.